Hi again. This is a quick case uh, that's uh, good to show to both seniors and juniors. This is a portable sitting chest x-ray on a patient who's known to have uh, cardiac disease. The reason I'm showing you the case is to look at this uh, unusual appearance of the right hemithorax. First of all, the right hemithorax is small in size compared to the left hemithorax. So there is some degree of volume loss. The right hemithorax has this uh, relatively smooth wavy line. For the less experienced, you might think that this is a visceral pleural line. Also, if you're unaware, you'd look at this peripheral area and question absence of vascular markings. If you follow that path of thinking, you might confuse this for a pneumothorax, which is not the case. Note that this line is very thick, and it has a high density that's equal or more than bone. This high density is consistent with calcification, and the way it follows the edge of the lung suggests that it's in the pleura. So this here is thick calcific change of the pleura. If you put all these findings together, the thick pleural calcifications and the decreased lung volume, this is consistent with calcific fibrothorax. Calcific fibrothorax is a chronic condition that results from a previous insult. Insults such as previous infections like TB, previous uh, pleural collections such as empyema or hemothorax, exposure to asbestos or connective tissue disorders have all been described with calcific fibrothorax. The commonest etiology that we see related to calcific fibrothorax is a prior tuberculous infection. Now the next point is very interesting to seniors to show. It's how to explain this lack of lung markings beyond that pleural thickening. When talking about calcific fibrothorax, the reason is not clearly explained in textbooks, and that's why I'm showing this. When you have chronic volume loss, what happens is the subpleural fat tries to compensate for that space. So this dead space here is filled with subpleural fat hypertrophy. I have seen one or two cases of calcific fibrothorax where they were misdiagnosed as pneumothoraces because of this reason. On the same patient, this is a part of the lower lungs as seen on an abdominal pelvic CT scan. You could see this extensive thickening of the uh, right uh, lower hemithoracic pleura with calcifications. The right lung is smaller in volume compared to the left lung, consistent with the volume loss. This is the non-affected side, and you see this fat underneath the pleura. This is the normal subpleural fat. It's not thick. Compare that appearance to the abnormal side, where the subpleural fat is thick and hypertrophied. So we learned from this case an entity called calcific fibrothorax may be caused by previous insults. Commonly, TB is the culprit. The classic appearance is thick pleural calcifications with volume loss. Another neat fact that we learned today is that there is something called the subpleural fat that's usually thin and may be hypertrophied with volume loss. And very importantly, do not confuse this appearance with a pneumothorax. There are expected features of prior surgery, as you see here. This is a left occipital craniotomy. In addition, you see those uh, fossae of uh, dense material, which are related to surgical uh, packing. There is also a ventricular peritoneal shunt. This is all known clinically and expected, and it's not the reason why I'm showing you the case. I'm showing you this to notice that you have no CSF spaces at all. There is diffuse effacement and obliteration of the cell side, so you don't see these dark lines that you expect to see here. 
you don't even see the uh, ventricular system. It's completely effaced and compressed. The CSF fluid in between folds in the cerebellum are called folia and those are also obliterated. The CSF spaces extending uh, around the uh, brainstem, the cisterns are also absent. So in general you have obliteration of the CSF spaces above and below the tentorium. This appearance is consistent with severe diffuse uh, brain edema. Add to that, in uh, multiple areas, there is loss of the normal gray-white matter differentiation. This is another example here, and this loss of differentiation could be associated with brain edema. However, you do not need to see this loss of differentiation for you to call brain edema, and that's an important point for seniors. Another thing that the uh, senior viewers might think about, since the patient has a ventricular peritoneal shunt, is overshunting with collapse of the ventricular system. This is not the case here for a few reasons. By overshunting, that means that uh, we by mistake are overdraining the CSF from the ventricles, which could lead to a small uh, slit like or even totally collapsed ventricular system. In that case, you would not expect to have effacement of the other CSF spaces. To the opposite, you'd expect with over drainage that the CSF spaces at the convexities would be more pronounced. Here's another case for comparison where there is no brain edema. In fact, this is an older patient uh, with some atrophic changes. In this comparison case, the CSF spaces are not effaced. You see the sulci, you see the ventricles, you see the cisterns. While in our abnormal case, again here, you see none of that. So this is a case of severe global supratentorial and infratentorial brain edemia secondary to anoxia. Remember that you may or may not have uh, associated loss of gray white matter differentiation with such cases. We also learned that in the presence of a shunt, there may be a condition called overshunting, in which the appearance would be totally different, especially that in such case you'd expect that the CSF space would be more pronounced above. Brain edema is a significant acute finding to convey to the clinician, although clinically they'll probably know about it. This is today's quick case, uh, hoping to see you with more cases soon. Thanks for watching. This is a good case uh, to show several uh, simple teaching points. The case has multiple findings. All the findings are everyday bread and butter findings that a radiologist may face. This is a good case for students uh, to get a sense of what a radiologist may see every day. It is also a good case to review a few basic uh, concepts for radiology residents, especially the junior ones. This is the porta hepatis, the entrance into the liver, and this is your portal vein. The space surrounding the portal vein should be clean. It should contain fat as clean as this subcutaneous fat. However, the fat around the porta hepatis appears to be dirty or stranded. And if you follow the branches of the portal vein within the liver, you're going to see the same appearance with fluid surrounding these portal triads. This appearance is called periportal edema.
The easiest way to remember the causes of periportal edema is to remember that it's usually a sign of inflammation, whether it's local or distant. Local causes of periportal edema would include uh, cholecystitis, hepatitis, cholangitis, or pancreatitis, things that are near. Distant causes would include inflammation elsewhere, such as from appendicitis, diverticulitis, or others. So what this tells us that there is a possible inflammatory condition within the abdomen. Another observed finding is the presence of this L-defined hypodensity in the liver compared to the normal enhancing liver elsewhere. Note that this area does not enhance, does not lead to mass effect as bulging or displacement of the vessels. It's not well defined. We don't have a pre-contrast study here, but if you had a pre-contrast, you'll still see this hypodensity without any change. And this segment of the liver is called segment 4, part of the left hepatic lobe. Remember that fat on a CT scan, such as subcutaneous fat, appears hypodense, and this is a classic appearance for fat deposition within the liver. So when you see this, remember that this is a very common appearance of focal fat uh, infiltration of segment 4. Fat infiltration may be focal, multifocal, or diffuse, but remember this is a common appearance and location. As we go lower down in the scan, you'll notice that you have this large heterogeneous uh, pelvic mass. Here's another look at this lesion. Now, a general rule here for residents is that if you see a pelvic mass, you have to decide where it originates from. Is it arising from the uterus? Is it arising from the ovaries? Is it arising from the adenexa or arising from adjacent structures? In this case, this is your uterus, and the case shows an abnormality that arises from the uterus, so this is uterine. Now, just to confirm the presence of this abnormality within a uterus, with another abnormality on the scan, there is this well-defined uh, simple cystic structure that arises adjacent to the uterus, so it's from the adenexa. In particular, this is likely arising from the left ovary, and ovarian cysts are very common, especially in young female patients. Uh, you have lots of functional cysts that you could see on everyday CT scans. Now, if the cyst appears more complex or has uh, any associated symptoms, you could evaluate this better with an ultrasound. Now, back to this uh, uterine abnormality, one of the thoughts that might cross your mind is this a malignant finding. With abnormalities of the uterus, you have to decide if the lesion arises from the myometrium, which is the muscle outside, or if it arises from the endometrium, which is the cavity here, the thing that you see inside. So again, the question is endometrium versus myometrium. And this makes a big difference, since endometrial abnormalities could be cancer, where myometrial abnormalities are very commonly fibroids, B9 lesions that are extremely common. Even on this transverse axial scan, you see that the lesion is in the myometrium and displaces the endometrium. The appearance is easier to appreciate on the sagittal scan where the abnormality is in the myometrium pushing the endometrium downwards. Here is a coronal image showing the abnormality in the myometrium displacing the endometrium, consistent with a fibroid. So in addition to the other findings that we saw, fibroids are very common abnormalities and they may appear as big as you see here. Just to complete some findings on the coronal image, here is the pure portal edema that we talked about earlier, suggestive that there is an inflammatory condition. Whenever you have a patient with acute abdominal pain, try to look for inflammatory changes in the abdomen. And once you see inflammatory changes, concentrate on that area to see what's causing it. As we explained on previous uh, cases, subcutaneous fat and intra-abdominal fat are dark on CT and appear clean. Having a dirty appearance of the fat, which we call fat stranding, is a sign of inflammation. Of course, the presence of fluid is another sign as well. 
Let's look at the fat here. The fat here looks clean. However, compare that to the fat in the right lower abdominal quadrant. You notice that there is some stranding. In addition to the fat stranding in the right lower quadrant, there is this uh, small amount of free fluid. So the area of inflammation is somewhere here. Now, an extremely common reason for right lower abdominal quadrant pain is acute appendicitis. So you have to look for the appendix. For radiology residents, uh, I'm sure that you saw the appendix by now, but one of the tough questions all the time is how could I find a difficult appendix? The easiest thing is to identify the cecum. This is here the transverse cone, and as you go on the right side lower down, this is part of your cecum. Now that you see the cecum, try to see the terminal ilium as it goes into it, the ileocecal junction. And here you have the terminal ilium as it goes into the cecum. Again, I'll go up and down to show you that. So you could identify the ileocecal junction, which is commonly lower in density and contains a fat lobule. In this case, you don't see a fat lobule, but you see the low density uh, internal content of the ilium as it goes into the cecum. So once you identify the ileocecal junction, the appendix would arise very close to that, classically below it. If you're looking for the tip of the appendix, you may have difficulties on finding that on a CT scan since the tip could be anywhere. So try to look for the base of the appendix, the place where it originates from, very close to the ileocecal junction, as we said, classically underneath it. Now that you did that, you'll notice that there's this tubular structure. And this structure is blind-ended. It's not continuous with the rest of the small bowel. We'll go over it again. This is consistent with the appendix. Notice how the tip of the appendix is small, while as you go towards the base, the base and the body of the appendix appear very thick. Looking more carefully into the thickness, you'll notice that the inner part of the appendix enhances, the outer part enhances, and the middle component is not enhancing. So here you have fluid within a dilated appendix. You have enhancing ring inside, a hypodense ring after that, and then a hyperdense ring outside. This double ring or target appearance is consistent with thickening due to edema in the wall. And now it's more clear that the fat around the appendix is not as clean as you expect. Compare that to the subcutaneous fat. This is fat stranding, a sign of inflammation. So in this patient with right lower quadrant abdominal pain, you have a dilated appendix with mural edema surrounding fat stranding and fluid consistent with appendicitis. One point that a few of the radiology residents I'm sure have noticed uh, is the appearance of the terminal ileum. When we teach you normal anatomy, we tell you that the colon contains feces while the small bowel should not contain any fecal material. We also emphasize that if you see fecal material in small bowels, that's called fecalization, it's a sign of bowel obstruction, distal to that point. But what we also have to emphasize is that you could see fecalization in distal small bowel loops without obstruction. And the reason you may see that without obstruction is delayed uh, emptying of contents from the small loops into the large bowel loops. Some patients may have longer transit time and uh, a delayed emptying of small bowel loop content. And in those patients with sluggish bowel movement, you could see some fecalization within the terminal ilium, so don't think it's obstruction all the time. And this is something that you could see also with patients who have a paralytic ileus, where the emptying from the small bowel loops is delayed as well. That's why it's not surprising in this case to see this appearance, since there is some post-inflammatory ileus in the distal bowel loop, which is dilated as you see, which led to secondary uh, formation of uh, partial uh, filling with fecal material of the distal ileum. Let's conclude the case by showing you the uh, terminal ileum as it goes into the uh, cecum on this coronal image. 
And you probably have figured out that looking at the coronal and sagittal images would make uh, finding the ileocecal junction easier. Once you identify the cecum and the ileocecal junction, try to look around it, in particular beneath it. You'll notice that the base of the appendix arises from there. And the appendix has all the features of acute appendicitis that we described a while ago on the transverse image. This is a thick appendix, and this is the tip here. So let's revise what we talked about on this case. We talked about preportal edema, and we said that it could result from local or distal inflammatory conditions. In this case, the reason there was preportal edema is extension of the inflammation from the appendix that we just discovered. Then we showed a very common finding of focal fat infiltration of segment 4 of the liver, and don't confuse that for a malignant lesion. We also saw a pelvic lesion and decided that the first thing you have to do is to discover where it originates from. Is it arising from the uterus, the ovaries, the adenexa, or adjacent structures such as small bowel or peritoneum? Once we decided that it arises from the uterus, we had to differentiate between myometrial and endometrial lesions. And once we decided that this is arising from the myometrium, we were more assured that this is one of the everyday commonly seen fibroids. We also saw a very common everyday lesion of a simple ovarian cyst that was a bit sizable in this patient. And we discussed that these lesions are better seen on ultrasound, and they're also better seen on MRI, by the way. We reviewed a very important concept in CT is that the intra-abdominal fat should be clean. If it's stranded, that's a sign of inflammation. Once you see the area of inflammation, you're more confident that the abnormality is uh, occurring somewhere there. In this case, appendicitis was a clinical concern, so we decided the easiest way to find the appendix is to find the ileocecal junction. Try to find the cecum, try to find the terminal ileum, try to find where they meet. A common location where you could see fat is the ileocecal junction as well. Once that is identified, the base of the appendix arises uh, very close to that and classically beneath it, and that's what we discovered here. Signs of acute appendicitis would be mural edema and thickening, distension of the appendix, surrounding inflammatory changes, and fluid. Try to identify the base of the appendix rather than identifying the tip of the appendix because looking for the tip could make it more difficult to find. And finally, we talked about fecalization, a famous sign of small bowel obstruction, however, could be seen with delayed emptying from small bowel lobes. We also talked about the utility of the coronal and sagittal reformats to make finding things more easier. This was a good case to show a few bread and butter findings that a radiologist may face every day. It's also a good case for students and not radiologists to get a sense of what we do. And it's a good case to revise basics and throw in a few tips for radiology residents. Thanks for watching. Your comments are appreciated. See you later.